questo sia un evento eccezionale per la qualità dei relatori eh, che ospita e anche oggi ne abbiamo un grande esempio e perché essendo tutto diciamo for free, tutto gratis e così pieno di cose la possibilità che anche quest'anno si sia svolto un evento del genere grazie anche alla collaborazione di chi ha contribuito spontaneamente credo sia una grande cosa e quindi credo che si debba fare un, un giusto tributo a, a questa cosa. Allora, questa è la seconda parte di eh, un panel che è cominciato ieri eh, sul futuro del giornalismo all digital. Mm, se per cortesia eh, usate Twitter, usate questo hashtag all digital, così chi sta seguendo può avere un, un flusso ehm, sul, su questo specifico panel. Ehm, sarà, farò una breve presentazione io, poi faremo un giro di tavolo e poi apriremo eh, alle domande del pubblico. Ok, parliamo un attimo di calcio. Eh, forse non tutti conoscete questo uomo, ma credo che molti di voi lo conoscano. Si chiama eh, Rudy Garcia, è l'allenatore della Roma. E cosa c'entra col giornalismo? Eh, c'entra perché eh, lo scorso autunno, dopo una storica rivincita nel derby con la Lazio, eh, Rudy Garcia pronuncia una frase che è rimasta eh, famosa, disse abbiamo riportato la chiesa al centro del villaggio. E secondo me questa metafora della chiesa e del villaggio si adatta benissimo alla situazione del giornalismo oggi. <coughs> Questo era il giornalismo come lo conoscevamo fino a un po' di tempo fa una chiesa con i suoi fedeli intorno e eh, che distribuiva eh, il suo verbo in maniera monodirezionale. Oggi rischiamo di trovarci in questa situazione, la chiesa deserta e abbandonata e eh, il, i, i lettori, i fedeli, in un altro villaggio a fare altre cose per conto loro. <coughs> Qual è lo scenario? Eh, lo, lo si dice da tanto tempo, forse i giornali sono morti, io dico di no, io dico che i giornali sono dei morti viventi, sono degli zombie tenuti in vita da un sistema industriale e da un, una macchina produttiva che è ancora per la maggior parte basata sulla stampa e sulla vendita delle copie cartacee. Ma questo è un modello che non ha futuro, eh, è un modello destinato eh, ad avere eh, una vita segnata, anche se poi Mark eh, ci racconterà un'altra storia probabilmente. E allora forse dobbiamo iniziare a immaginare un mondo, un giornalismo senza giornali. Eh, non funziona più. Sorry. C'è un, pic un piccolo problema. <ride> ok, <ride> il grosso problema con il quale ci troviamo a fare i conti è quello della pietra filosofale della sostenibilità economica. Alcuni su, questi, su questo ci scherzano anche sopra, io ho preso qualche esempio da Twitter, questo è quello che dice Martin Bellam, che tra l'altro è anche qui a Perugia a fare alcuni panel, questa è l'opinione di Brian Stelter, giornalista della CNN, e questo è quello che dice Clay Shirky, dice la logica della nostra era è la fusione di bit e atomi, informazioni e oggetti, eh, sapere e avere, il tuo selfie è una caramella, perché c'è un sito dove tu puoi mandare la tua foto di Instagram, loro te la stampano su una caramella, a dimostrazione che tra digitale e analogico, e tra virtuale e reale, non c'è alcuna differenza. Io ho anche raccolto gli, i tweet di alcuni speaker. Emily Bell doveva essere qui, non è potuta venire. Al suo posto c'è Om Malik di eh, Giga Om. Eh, però abbiamo comunque, eh, possiamo anche leggere quello che lei pensa del giornalismo digitale. 
E questo invece è quello che eh, recentemente ha scritto Matthew Ingram in un suo eh, post e la, poi l'ha messo su Twitter. Io ho provato un po' a uh, sintetizzare la situazione. Abbiamo notizie e redazioni, quindi contenuto e contesto. Cioè significa produzione e cura. Notizie che arrivano dall'esterno e quindi hanno necessità di essere verificate. Notizie che richiedono specializzazione e dall'altra parte aggregazione di vari tipi di specializzazione. Lavoro di squadra e distribuzione delle notizie. Notizie guidate dai dati, distribuzione e contesto guidate dagli analytics, quindi dalle metriche, dai dati di traffico e di condivisione. Quindi, sintetizzando ancora di più, contenuto più contesto, professionisti più dilettanti, mainstream e social media, attraverso piattaforme di condivisione portano a fare giornalismo, che è ben diverso da essere giornalisti, concetto che non ha più senso di esistere. Prima di lasciare la parola ai nostri relatori, ho fatto un breve elenco puntato di temi che potrebbero essere il, il filo conduttore di questa discussione e lo vado rapidamente a illustrare. Il primo, pensare mobile. Ci sono un miliardo di eh, smartphones distribuiti, venduti nel mondo solo nel 2014. Non credo ci sia bisogno di aggiungere altro. Quindi progettazione, contenuti, profilazione, user experience in funzione del mobile. Rendere le notizie fruibili come fossero uno snack, atomizzarle e ehm, distribuirle, renderle utilizzabili dai nostri utenti in ogni momento, in ogni luogo, senza la necessità di consumare un pasto completo. Indossare le notizie. Eh, siamo nell'era dei media umani, con eh, i cosiddetti wearable devices, e quindi anche l'informazione diventa un'esperienza sensoriale. Imparare a mh, contaminare i linguaggi, nuovi linguaggi, nuovi codici di programmazione sono impo è importante per il giornalismo. Sapere chi sono i nostri sovrani, i lettori e i dati, e in base alla ormai famosa regola delle 5C, contesto, conversazione, cura, comunità, collaborazione, io ho aggiunto la customizzazione dei contenuti sulle esigenze degli utenti. E di conseguenza l'importanza dell'engagement. Questa è una frase che io ho eh, diciamo, preso in prestito dal professor Jeff Jarvis, che dice che non è importante la quantità di interazioni, e forse nemmeno il tempo, ma quello che conta è la qualità e quindi bisognerebbe essere in grado di misurare l'impatto del lavoro che facciamo sui nostri lettori. L'importanza di uno user generated content di qualità. Eh, Facebook ha appena ha, da poco avviato il servizio Newswire, che è quello che eh, secondo loro dovrebbe fornire contenuti verificati e selezionati per un uso prettamente giornalistico. La dicotomia tra mondo chiuso delle applicazioni e mondo aperto del web, non so se si tratta di una possibile convivenza o prima o poi bisognerà scegliere una delle due, ma dobbiamo essere eh, consapevoli che esistono queste due dimensioni. Su questo non c'è bisogno di dire molto, lo diranno probabilmente i nostri eh, speaker, l'importanza del brand personale. Che oggi tu sia un singolo, un gruppo o una testata, si parte tutti sullo stesso piano, tutti con le stesse possibilità. Il punto è capire se questo porterà a una competizione esasperata o si possono immaginare delle forme di collaborazione sempre nel, per il bene del nostro lettore e del nostro utente. E infine, pensare in grande, dove eh, il concetto di globale non è necessariamente di dimensione ma di strategia e di obiettivo. Eh, se pensiamo all'open source, ci sono un, molte eh, nicchie che sono in realtà globali. E io ho scelto il New York Times come ultima immagine di questa presentazione perché penso che se c'è una chiesa che è rimasta ben salda al centro del proprio villaggio, quella è il New York Times. Loro ce l'hanno fatta, hanno riportato la chiesa al centro del villaggio. 
Il punto è se e come ce la farà il giornalismo. Ne parliamo oggi con loro amico Om Melik, Matthew Ingram e Mark Kaiwa. Allora, Om, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. Ok. Um, uh, ho questa domanda per te. Um, Clay Shirky, in uno dei suoi eh, saggi, eh, racconta la, eh, quello che lui chiama gli errori del milkshake. Cioè, quando McDonald's chiese una ricerca di mercato sui eh, consumatori del milkshake, la maggior parte dei ricercatori si concentrarono sul prodotto, sul gusto, sulla dolcezza, su, su, sulla qualità del prodotto. Un gruppo di ricercatori, un solo gruppo di ricercatori, si concentrò invece sui consumatori e si accorse che il milkshake veniva consumato da persone che entravano la mattina da sole, uscivano e non lo consumavano lì. Si sono domandati perché e hanno capito che erano dei commuters, dei pendolari, che usavano il milkshake in funzione della capacità di poterlo consumare mentre andavano in macchina da casa al lavoro. E quindi il successo del milkshake non riguardava il prodotto, ma riguardava il suo eh, uso da parte dei consumatori. È questo il problema dei media oggi e del, e del giornalismo oggi? Siamo troppo concentrati sul prodotto e troppo poco su chi usa e come usa questo prodotto? Yes and no. The, 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 the problem with the media is that it is often looking for answers within itself instead of trying to pay attention to what people actually want. And that problem has been there forever. And that is why you have editors and they are relevant is because they believe they have a certain point of view of the world and that's what the world should get. So it's not something new, now it's a bit more amplified because the reader feedback is much more immediate and at a much larger scale because of the social media. So if you are readers and you don't agree with the, with the publication, you can express your disagreement very loudly at a much larger scale, so which leads to news entities reacting on too far to the spectrum and saying we have to pay attention to the readers too much. So that, that balance is not there. I think that's the key, key thing which makes magazines and brands and products successful is where you find the brand or a magazine or a publication's point of view is equally relevant as is the reader input. Some of the publications which have been able to do that in the past have been very successful. Economist is a good example of that publication which is a perfect match for its content and its readers. There is a very, there is a lot of, uh, you know, a symbiotic, strong symbiotic relationship between the, the brand and the readers. It used to be the case with Forbes back in when it was just a magazine. It had a very strong uh, affinity between Forbes brand, Forbes uh, editors, and the Forbes readers, and they were very closely associated and everybody related to that. And I think right now, because of the number of choices we have, people have not been able to form those kind of bonds, and I think that's a challenge more than anything else. It's not it's not something new, but it's just at a much larger scale now. Senti, tu, tu hai... Si sente? Sì. Tu, uh, non, diciamo che nel tuo lavoro, nella tua impresa, non ti devi preoccupare della stampa. Questo è un vantaggio o uno svantaggio? Rispetto ai tuoi concorrenti che invece hanno un problema di far quadrare i conti in entrambi i i settori. Tu non hai il problema dei costi, ma non hai neanche il problema de, neanche i ricavi. Yes, I think the the large publications have the problem, the legacy publications have the problem of the press and distribution and the pension funds and all those kind of things. That is true, but they also have an advantage that they have a lot more resources, they have a lot more connections and they have a lot more longevity as, as a brand 
to compete with some of the new digital upstarts. And I think that is, so it, it is an even game in, in that sense. What wins is somebody who is quicker and faster to re, you know, meet the needs of its audience. Uh, one of the things we have done at our company very well from day one is that from day one we knew who we were writing for. And it was very important for us to know who, which is the audience we are going after. We cannot win all one billion, you know, five billion people will not read our site. But we wanted the between five to 10 million like-minded people to come to our publication and become part of the community. And we didn't start with the idea of five million people. We started with the idea of can we get 50 people to pay attention to us? Those 50 people led to 500, to 500, to 5,000. But every single time, whatever we have done, we have kept that focus as to where we are going to be, why we are doing this, who are our readers, do you know what we write meets their needs. And I think that kind of desire to pay attention to the reader's needs is what has helped us. Like we are almost 12 years old now, and I think that has been the rule uh, at the company from day one, is that we're going to be highly focused on the reader and meet their needs. So, you know, all the, all the economic arguments are pretty pointless. At the end of the day, what matters is what do you write and what do you publish, and is it good enough for your readers to pay attention to it? And the only way you can do that is by being highly focused and being true to only one community, that is your reader. I think that's, that's what matters in this day and age, especially that there's like now tens and thousands of publications and more and more are coming up every day. So it just is going to become even harder and harder for publications. Very few people can exist with like large scale because you need focus. And I think that's, that's where you know, some of the smaller brands like the digital brands have an advantage. Grazie. Poi ti farò qualche altra domanda, ma dopo. Allora, tu eh, insieme a tuo marito Chris gestisci Homicide Watch DC, che è questo sito che è focalizzato, che è nato come un sito eh, locale, focalizzato su, un, su uno specifico tema, che è quello di tenere monitorate i crimini nell'area uh, di Washington eh, dal punto di vista della produzione giornalistica, delle, delle sentenze e dell'attività investigativa della polizia e dei tribunali e però anche e soprattutto delle segnalazioni eh, dei lettori. Eh, è una formula che ha avuto successo, Homicide Watch eh, si è esteso in, in altre parti degli, degli Stati Uniti e però la cosa che, che, mi, che mi ha colpito del, del vostro lavoro e di cui parlavamo anche prima è questa vostra capacità di adattarvi al modo in cui i vostri lettori interagiscono con voi e usano, tra virgolette, le notizie che voi fornite. Adattare anche il sito e, e la sua usabilità. Questo significa che forse noi a volte ci fidiamo troppo delle nostre supposizioni a priori e non andiamo a verificare se poi sono giuste o sbagliate? I, I think that is exactly the lesson that we've learned from Homicide Watch. And, and I want to start just by backing up a little bit and um, taking this moment to remember that it's been five years now since we started Homicide Watch, which is an incredible amount of time to really think about. And you have to wonder, you know, five years in, are we really still a startup? I feel like yes, because it is still just two of us working um, on Glass Eye Media, which is the company that runs and licenses Homicide Watch. Um, and, and it's been an incredible journey to this beautiful stage here today with these incredible panelists who I'm so pleased to be a, a part of this conversation. Um, we couldn't have done it without the community, the journalism community supporting us. And that includes this community here gathered, all of you sitting here with us. It was the Knight Foundation that gave me um, a Knight News Entrepreneurs Fellowship uh, about four years ago, back in the early days. Um, ONA that gave me the MJ Bear Fellowship that sent me to the very first, um, my very first ONA conference. 
the Neiman and Berkman foundations that after that gave me a year at Harvard um, and MIT to study and learn. Um, and again, the Knight Foundation, the Boston Foundation, and WBUR that said, okay, we see what you've done with Homicide Watch. Let's do this now with covering education reform. And so I have to say thank you to this community um, that has made this journey um, to Perugia possible. Um, this, is, this is how the future is built, so thank you. Um, the reason Homicide Watch has been successful is because of the assumptions that we've made, um, both the assumptions that we've made and the assumptions that we've avoided. Um, I, I started thinking about these assumptions um, because I think they're really what our business is based on. And it was based first on not making certain assumptions. This was an assumption that was made about Mrs. Field's Cookies, um, a very popular cookie shop in the US. It's in every mall. Um, and the founder was told, a cookie store is a bad idea. Uh, besides, the market research reports say America liked crisp cookies, not soft and chewy cookies like you make. And of course, this was proved false. Uh, 1948, television won't last. It's a flash in the pan. Of course, we all know what happened with that. And more recently, to J.K. Rowling, children just aren't interested in witches and wizards anymore. <laughs> in D.C., we were told all the homicides are just drug deals gone bad. This was an assumption by a local D.C. editor. And that led us to Homicide Watch D.C. Um, Homicide Watch DC receives about a half a million page views a month with one full-time equivalent reporter. These are actually three part-time interns that add up to one full-time employee. Half a million page views a month for three interns working 40 hours a week. It's not bad. And the model has spread uh, through licensing partnerships to other cities. First in Trenton, New Jersey in partnership with a Trentonian. Next in Chicago, in partnership with the Sun-Times. And most recently in Boston, the site just launched about a week ago in partnership with Northeastern University, where I'm teaching Homicide Watch as a class to graduate students and undergraduate students. The reason we were able to work past those assumptions um, is because we were so closely tied to our audience and so closely following what they were interested in what they were trying to do, and what they needed from the news. I spent a lot of time looking at how people were trying to interact with the news that I was interested in creating. And I saw that they were actually creating it themselves. They were trying to follow homicide cases. They were trying to memorialize and remember their friends and family members on Facebook, on Twitter, on online obituaries. And I watched on those platforms what people were trying to do, what jobs they were trying to do. Part of that was also identifying the existing communities where people already were and saying, it's not my job to replicate that, but instead to improve and build upon it and make those jobs easier. We do this in part through a process called empathy mapping. If you're familiar with it, it it's a popular design school tool. Um, you look at what people say, think, do, and feel about your topic. And it's a really valuable tool to build past those assumptions that you make about what your audience needs and wants, the things that you commonly hear, and discover the deeper needs and wants that you might be able to then build a better business on. We do a lot of user testing, um, both formal and informal. Um, my favorite moments, most useful moments, really, um, are out on the beat where I'm talking to people about what I'm working on where I'm watching them use my site. Um, in the early days of Homicide Watch, when I was in the courthouse every day, I'd see young teenagers in court for friends' cases, and a case that I had covered on Homicide Watch would come up, and I'd see them on their phone, although you could get in a lot of trouble for being on your phone in the courtroom. I'd see them on the phone looking up the case, um, and I'd say, okay, we know, we know we've met our audience now. Finally, repetition. We go through this process again and again in a continual loop. So this is how we build past the assumptions that maybe hurt us. The flip side of this is the assumptions that help us. Um, and there are a lot of assumptions that help us. And these are tested assumptions 
that connect us to the audience and help us build smarter. Um, for Homicide Watch, this is really shown in the approach that we're now calling structured journalism. And I spoke about this yesterday and in this same room yesterday afternoon. In structured journalism, what we do is we identify patterns in our coverage so that we are able to identify the pathways that people go through, through the story and through the narrative. And we find what stays the same over time. This helps us to identify possible outcomes. And for the reporter and editor, that means that we are rarely surprised when anything happens. And because we are rarely surprised, we are able to better educate um, and inform our readers about what the possible outcomes are and what this universe that we're describing is like. Within that, what we're really trying to do is build context and understanding. Because what we really deeply believe, what, what the heart of Homicide Watch is, is that an informed community is an engaged community. And that by raising the level of information that we're providing, we provide deeper engagement and, and better communities. And again, the cycle repeats again and again. Um, that's what we've done with Homicide Watch um, in the four cities that we're in now. It's what we're trying to do with Learning Lab, which is the new project um, in structured reporting um, covering education reform in Massachusetts. Um, and, and I will not lie and say it's an easy process. It's a difficult process that takes time and takes a lot of deep listening. Um, it takes a lot of empathy and it takes a lot of grace. It means stepping back a lot of times and realizing and remembering that you're there for the audience, you're there for the community, and you're a servant to that. You're not the star of it, you're not the heart of it. Um, and that's an assumption that I think helps us a lot. Grazie. Una, una domanda. Prima mi spiegavate che eh, voi avete creato questo software per, per il lavoro che, eravate, eh, che avevate immaginato di fare a livello locale e ora che vi state espandendo, diciamo, concedete la licenza di questo, show, di questo software ai vostri partner. Potenzialmente questa cosa può crescere ed è questa la forza del digitale, il, il diventare globali che si diceva prima, perché se io a Roma volessi fare Homicide Watch Roma, potrei chiedere a voi la licenza del software e lanciare il mio Homicide Watch Roma. Questo, alla lunga, può diventare un problema. Un'impresa che nasce, diciamo, familiare, personale, locale, nel momento in cui si espande, eh, porta dei vantaggi, ma probabilmente anche degli svantaggi di gestione. Avete immaginato questo tipo di scalabilità? We have a lot, and I think we're at the point right now where we've reached the limits. We're, we're nearing the limits of what Chris and I can do together. Um, we do strongly believe that a network of Homicide Watch sites um, is more valuable than a single Homicide Watch site, in part because we're interested in comparing how the criminal justice system is working in D.C. compared to Trenton, compared to Chicago. Part of what makes Homicide Watch work is that because we are able to look at the universe, every homicide from crime to conviction, we're better able to understand what is usual and what is unusual. Now that's in one city. If we're able to expand that um, nationally or globally, I think it's a really interesting idea to think about comparing how the criminal justice system works in Chicago or DC to, for example, Johannesburg or Sao Paulo. Mm. And that that becomes really um, an interesting community tool um, that can improve our conversations about criminal justice um, and justice worldwide. Thank you. Matthew. L'anno scorso tu hai tenuto un keynote speech qui a Perugia e hai parlato di una fortezza che si doveva aprire. Oggi forse non c'è bisogno di aprirla quella fortezza perché sta crollando. Io ho detto nella mia introduzione che dobbiamo immaginare un, un giornalismo senza giornali ed era il titolo di un tuo post di qualche mese fa. Eh, è un'eresia, visto che parlavamo di chiesa, il giornalismo senza giornali o è la strada?
Va, funziona? Is it working now? It's not on. There we go. How about now? No? How about yeah. now? Yeah. Hey, there we go. Yeah. That gave me more time to think about my answer. <laughs> um, is it the path we should be following? Journalism without newspapers? I don't know. It's the path we are following. It is, uh, to some extent, going to happen whether we want it to or not. So I think, for me at least, it forces me, thinking about that forces me to think about what journalism is without newspapers. What is journalism without anything? What, what is journalism at all? What are we trying to do? Um, and I think Laura in her presentation got at some of that. What you are trying to do is inform people, educate people to some extent, engage with people around a topic, make it make sense to them, give them some context for events that are happening in their lives. How you do that, whether it's on paper or audio or video or all of those things together, whether it's on their phone, whether it's on a tablet, whether it's in Google Glass or some new technology, in a lot of ways is irrelevant. Those things are, are just delivery vehicles. They're just mechanisms for delivering the information. It, it, what you are doing is more important to some extent than how you are doing it. And obviously how you choose to do it is going to determine a lot about whether you succeed or fail because there are business considerations, you know, there are costs in, involved in those different platforms. But to me, you know, I've, I've given this presentation a, num a number of times about whether the, these are the best of times or the worst of times for journalism. And in a lot of fundamental ways, it, they are both, these times are both the best and the worst. They're the best for journalism, period, for the, for the practice of the thing that we call journalism by anyone, whether they consider themselves journalists or not. It is the best of times because you can reach so many more people so easily um, and you can engage with them in ways that were never possible before. Those things are all good. It's the worst of times if you happen to run a newspaper or a traditional media entity because your business model is being completely disrupted. So I think we have to think of those two things very differently. Um, there's the thing you are trying to do, which is to some extent easier and, and better now. And then there's how you do it and of course whether you make money. And those are two very different questions. Senti, perché sei scettico sul cosiddetto giornalismo di spiegazione? Explanatory journalism. It's, it's not that I'm skeptical of the need. I mean, I think there is definitely a need. Journalism has always, good journalism has always been explanatory. You know, to some extent, I think some of the reaction to the, the big sites, Vox and uh, Nate Silver's 538 and so on, is, is a reaction from journalists thinking, well, that's what we always were supposed to be doing. You know, explaining things is what, to some extent, journalism consists of. So, do we need dedicated sites that just explain things? Well, clearly Wikipedia does that. So, Wikipedia gets a huge amount of traffic. People enjoy using it. It's, it's, a, it's a great tool. And so, those things are clearly necessary. What I'm not convinced of is whether we need large companies that just do that, whether that's a sort of monetizable thing. And I don't think, to be honest, I don't think Nate Silver or Ezra Klein know that either. But it's certainly going to be fascinating to watch. I, I know, thinking about what uh, Laura has done with Homicide Watch, those types of things make me think about what we used to think of as a journalistic entity, a newspaper, a TV station, was, was this broad sort of mass thing that did thousands of different things. It did comics and horoscopes and the gardening column and soccer and, sorry, football, and, uh, and all sorts of other things all wrapped into one. Now we're seeing all those things get sliced up and distributed and done by different things and they're different sites. So there are companies that are <coughs> devoted to one specific thing, like say homicides, where you would never have been able to make that. You would never have had a newspaper with just homicides in it. But you can have an entire website that focuses on that for people who are, that's, that's what they're the most interested in. And those things can succeed in a way that a traditional media entity would never have done before. Ci sono alcuni critici esperti di 
media e news, soprattutto negli Stati Uniti, cito Michael Wolf, che sono abbastanza poco convinti della possibilità di successo di questi brand personali di cui parlavamo prima, da Isra Klein a Nate Silver. Qual è il tuo pensiero al riguardo? Well, Michael Wolf uh, doesn't believe in a lot of things. Um, he believes in Michael Wolf uh, very much. And uh, he himself is a brand, so I don't really understand that criticism. I mean, his business consists mostly of just being Michael Wolf, as far as I can tell. So, um, and of course, he has a failed media venture of his own. Um, so, I wonder whether. You know, to some extent, I think we're in a very, we're in the sort of um, experimental phase right now. Everyone is trying everything, or should be. Um, we don't know, to be honest, I don't know, Michael doesn't know what is going to work. There are things that probably wouldn't have worked five years ago that will work now. Um, there are probably things people are trying now that seem crazy that, that will eventually work. Wikipedia, I remember, most people I spoke to thought it was the most ridiculous thing they had ever heard of. Um, Twitter it was exactly the same. I thought it was ridiculous at the time. I'm pretty sure Ohm did too. It just seemed like a, a, a sort of useless thing that hardly anybody would use. So I, I don't think we have the, it, you know, I wish I did, but I don't think we have the ability right now to say this will work or th and this won't. I think we're, we're feeling our way around and we're sort of, we're, we're grabbing onto principles that we that we want to pursue, and different people are taking sort of different cracks at how to do that and how to turn those things into a business. But I don't think we really understand what is going to really take off and what is not. That's why I'm, I try to watch everything. I don't, you know, I, I can't pick, this is going to be the next big thing and this isn't. The next big thing always looks like a toy, always looks like something ridiculous. Um, volevi aggiungere qualcosa? I just a couple of things to what uh, Matthew said. Um, you know, a lot of the people, including people like Michael Wolf and other experts, are looking at the world of media from the world they know, the world which has been in the past. It's very hard to imagine the world in the future. And I think that is what is the scary part of this thing, is that people who are deemed to be experts They're looking backwards and walking into the future, and when you do that, you're very likely to walk into a, a pole. Like, that's what it really is. And I think, you know, Mr. Wolf might be a very smart man, but he, he has no idea what the future looks like. A lot of it, like, probably nobody does. If, if we did, we could, you know, there's no difference between man and God there, you know? So that is one. The other thing the media people are very worried and scared of and kind of uneasy about is that in the past we used to define behaviors. We would define how you would read the baseball news or the football news or what would be the, the front page or what TV shows which should be put on the air. Now the readers, the viewers, the actual users, the people who pay with their attention and money, they decide how and which behaviors are more relevant. Twitter became successful not because of Twitter, it became successful because people decided to use it right. a certain way. And it's the same thing with other public, you know, like animated GIFs as a media format, how does that make any sense? But it does because of the fact people decided that that's how they want to share, you know, some kind of news and entertainment. And I think the behaviors are now more democratic. They are more defined by the masses. And I think that is the scary prospect to some of the establishment, the media establishment. And, and in fact, um, just to back up what Om said, the Clay Shirky has a term called the shock of inclusion, um, which is a great term. Uh, Clay, you know, his primary job is to come up with really, really mm -hmm. catchy uh, phrases for what's going on in journalism, in journalism. So the shock of inclusion, he meant traditional media sort of dealing with what Om just described. The fact that the reader the user, the people formerly known as the audience, have so much more power than they used to. Not just in terms of user behavior, but in terms of what they pay attention to and what they don't, and in terms of creating yeah. what we call journalism. That's a fundamental disruption sì. of the traditional... Lui, lui lo, eh, Shirky lo chiama il triathlon dei media. 
non è più solo comunicazione, ma è anche produzione e condivisione. Quindi questo significa che il consumatore agisce right. doppiamente rispetto a, a quanto faceva prima. Poi vi farò un'altra domanda, preparatevela, perché avete chiuso paid content? E intanto però vorrei introdurre Mark, eh, che ci parlerà di un altro punto di vista. Lui è un, non è un giornalista, è uno stratega digitale che si occupa soprattutto dello sviluppo digitale del, del continente africano. Ha appena scritto un, un interessantissimo rapporto che poi lui vi, vi, vi dirà come scaricare. E lui mh, diciamo che è colui che gli editori di carta stampata considerano eh, il modello. Perché? Perché lui, eh, l'Africa e altri paesi emergenti, l'Asia, il subcontinente indiano, consentono all'industria della carta stampata globale di segnare comunque un segno più eh, alla fine dell'anno nella eh, vendita, nella circolazione di copie. Infatti nel suo rapporto, contrariamente a quanto abbiamo detto noi finora, lui non parla di rivoluzione dei media, ma parla di evoluzione dei media. Ce lo vuoi spiegare? Sure, uh, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here and again. Um, uh, very uh, thanks to, to Chris, um, Francesca and the whole team and certainly to every one of the panelists. It's been great to, to take in what they're saying. So, so much like you said, Andrea, I, I, um, uh, I now run a company called Nendo and um, we published uh, East Africa's first digital media trend report and you can find that on our website, so shameless plug. <laughs> nendo.co.ke, which is n-e-n-d-o.co.ke, and, um, and there you find, ag again at length, our 15 trends which we expect to, to transform the digital media landscape and, and, uh, and, 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 and much more. Uh, the, one of the main ones is actually WhatsApp, which I'll speak a little bit about, the instant messenger and how that changes the newsroom. But uh, to your question, we, we posit that Uh, much like people, like you said, like Michael Wolff and experts such as those based in more established and developed media economies and media markets, they aren't necessarily looking at Sao Paulo or Beijing or Johannesburg or Nairobi, where I'm based. Uh, they're looking at it from their, I'm not going to call it an ivory tower, but they're looking at it on the basis of, of the history and the legacy that they have. And by all, by all means, we need them to look at it that way, because for us, Well, for a long time, when you're sitting in Nairobi, you say that, oh, we're looking at a crystal ball of South Africa. So when you look at what, for example, the Mail and Guardian is doing there with um, Kindle sales of their newspaper or um, experiments that they're doing on, on the iPad, you, you know, we, we look at it and say, wow, look at that, that's, that's impressive. Whereas for them, they say they're looking at a crystal ball that's now, you know, they're looking at DC, they're looking at, you know, CNN, they're looking at American based media and media based in, in London. Now, all of that combined, if we go back to the analogy that you shared of, uh, of the church and the village, the way I take it is that I imagine that as much as we, you know, perhaps here, sitting, um, sitting in Perugia, we're looking at it based on the context of here and ma many, ma many parts of the developed world, we're saying that there is the church and the village. The way I see it, We're in Africa and in parts of the emerging uh, economies of the world, we have a marketplace where there are street preachers, right? So imagine we're not in a church in a physical structure, but why, you know, it's a place with 12 different doors and people walking in and out. It's a village square, you know, full of um, villagers and people walking in and out. And what we have are now the street, street preachers who, instead of taking the dais here and speaking to you, are going outside and putting two crates down and trying to get as much of anybody's attention as they can. And so even in terms of like uh, developing um, a, a mindset around that, you know, when we see Jeff Bezos by the Washington Post, you know, everybody's like, okay, all right, something, uh, something's, something's changing. You know? And um, you know, if you look at Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and the age of digital journalism, for the longest time, the way we learned about, um, about the Middle East or about um, South America or about what's happening in Asia is through the CNNs and the BBCs of the world. So we saw it through the lens of these more established media houses who could have all these international correspondents. Now, it's sexy to have Africa as part of like your media portfolio. And so like you have 
the BBCs and the CNNs obviously pursuing this a lot more now. And the challenge is that they're doing it in the way they always have, the foreign correspondent sitting somewhere. Whereas it's not the case for, um, um, for China Central Television, for example, who've chosen Nairobi as you know, their Africa headquarters and they're coming in. And you know, who's to say they won't come in with WeChat, for example. So they're coming in with social media built uh, and scaled in China and bringing it into Africa. Now, what does that mean for Facebook? What does that mean for Twitter? What does that mean for social media as we've seen it transform the West, right? So there's, a, there's, you know, there's an all new territory that's, that's kind of up for grabs, if you like, and this is the rest um, of, the, of the developing world. Now, why I said um, one of the categories of the trends in this report is media evolution and not revolution is that as much as we might declare um, print is dead, uh, radio is dead and so on. Radio is everything in Africa now. It's unquestionably the number one way. I think Amadou uh, Ba, who was on a panel with me two days ago, he says that radio is the most downloaded app in Africa because you'll find it on the highest number of phones out there. And with um, you know, 800 million uh, mobile phone subscribers and a population of a billion, you still have um, uh, I, I, the, the chance that the mobile is going to be the most disruptive um, device to media itself and to business and to society and communication. Where I'm from in Kenya, it's, it's the way we do payments and nobody does you know, mobile payments better than Kenyans, right? Not anybody here. It's easier for me to pay for anything. I mean, I, I will literally take you know, 10 seconds and before you can lift your credit card out of your pocket, I've paid for something faster than you, right? And I, and I, and I know that th you know, this is the truth. So what happens when I say with that same phone Right, that I'm going to pay a subscription service to get updates of the news. I never signed up for Twitter. I have the app on my phone. I have the mobile internet. But I pay this new subscription to a news service, and they put a number of journalists on a beat exact, you know, for me, 160 character updates, where I, you know, I, I don't know social media, but I'm participating in it in a form of its own. Right? And I, now I have another place to express my sentiments and get, you know, give feedback back to the newsroom and a lot of these people. And if you look at examples, I think of, um, uh, let's say what Al Jazeera has done with, with its show, The Stream, where they, you know, they, you know, they're based obviously in the Middle East, and so now, you know, as an African, I'm learning about the Middle East through their lens, um, not just uh, perhaps through CNNs or the BBCs. Likewise for Beijing, I'm learning about it through CCTV. Now what they did as Al Jazeera, what this one show, The Stream, why I point that out is because I think there's a couple good examples of where they took on and challenged Africans to speak to them. So the way they describe this show, The Stream, if you've ever had the chance to see it, is that it's a social media community with its own TV show. And every day, first thing in the morning, they say, what do you want us to put on the show today? And people will obviously, you know, so they literally, it's blank slate every single day. And um, there's been, uh, if some of you followed, for example, Kony 2012, when that, yeah. when, uh, when, that, when that came out, that, you know, you had, Invisible Children, and I mean, I won't go into the details, but the show on the stream of that was pretty significant, and there was one, for example, on, um, on uh, skin lightening creams and skin bleaching um, it with people of color across the world, and they got a phenomenal response. I learned about things from Latin America and just so many other things around race, and this is tapping into that digital community who wanted to steer um, the newsroom, to steer uh, journalism, and the more that enterprises outside perhaps of the US and the UK begin and, and then obviously Europe begin to consider what this new audience is and that the fact that they are digitally savvy and, um, and, uh, and taking part in technology, they might be willing to trade parts of their privacy for more access, right? So we, 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 we are, I mean, we, we, we can ask totally new questions where it's like, you know, for more access, would you give us access to this? Would you allow us to communicate with you in this way? And I think it, it opens up a fantastic debate uh, for what it looks like in the rest of the world, but most importantly, what lessons can we take from right here, right now, with what's happened? Um, I'd love to see Michael Will spend some time in Nairobi, and I'd love to know <laughs> what he thinks, you know? But, but yeah, that's, uh, that's probably what I'd share for now. Grazie. Um, Mark, ieri, nel, nel primo di questi panel su, sul giornalismo digitale, Andy Carving ha detto che eh, la generosità è il motore dei social media. Allora io vorrei approfittare della tua presenza per mh, parlare un attimo eh, dal tuo punto di vista de, di un esempio che viene dal Kenya e eh, che è quello di Ushahidi. 
ci vuoi raccontare come nasce questa piattaforma e che cosa significa per il giornalismo? Um, so, so during the, the 2007 and 2008 election in Kenya, um, there was a contested electoral result and what, what followed was a period where the traditional media was not fully reporting what was going on in the country. And what this led a number of bloggers and, um, and technologists at the time, about five of them to do, was they hacked and put together essentially what was um, um, a very rough uh, an early stage tool to crowdsource or crowd map um, what was actually happening. So was there an outbreak of violence? Was there unrest? Was there people demonstrating the streets? The TV station was going to be right there and not capture it. The journalists on the beat would not report it, but you as a citizen could text in. And what this did in 2007-2008 is, you know, fast track it to now, uh, ushahidi, which is the Swahili word for testimony or witness, uh, has become, you know, a global, in, you know, very innovative and very forward-thinking enterprise that's looked at this challenge of how do we involve SMSs, tweets, Facebook updates, um, uh, you know, geotagged and uh, geolocated um, uh, bits of data, and how do we map that out? And the best example is what happened, for example, with the earthquake in Haiti or the tsunami in, um, in, in Japan um, or um, Snowmageddon in the U.S. You know, the, it, it, you, it's basically you know, self-serve. So if you had, you know, the, for example, the tube strike in London, you know, people would now discover where it is that, that, you know, and what's happening and be able to make decisions based off of that. Now, for the newsroom, what, what a tool like this has done, and it hasn't, it's been used in conjunction with newsmakers and, uh, and news organizations. Um, to cover and, 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 and assist with particularly crowdsourcing of information. So where you now have people all submitting um, uh, you know, information from different parts and perhaps translating it, representing it on a map, and that alone being one of the ways that the, the media room um, opens up to, to invite not only feedback but to allow people to co-create what, what content they publish um, and how, you know, how the story uh, concludes itself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, that's a great example. Ushahidi is a great example of, of a, a sort of motto that I like to, to talk about. When, when it comes to what we call citizen journalism or network journalism or whatever you want to call it, journalism that's committed by people who may not be professional journalists, you see the value of that so clearly when the traditional media is not doing its job. So in that case, in Kenya, it was not doing its job. Uh, Turkey is another great example. The Ukraine is another great example. The actual, the sort of facts about what was happening, particularly in the Turkish election, were not being distributed by the traditional media because of conflicts of interest and their own interest in remaining friendly with the government and so on. So what you saw was people going to Twitter and Facebook and, and effectively crowdsourcing their own news because they didn't, literally did not have a source of news. So that's, I mean, you, you can really see the power of, uh, there's a group in, in Turkey actually called uh, At 140 Journos, fascinating example of non-journalists performing a fundamentally journalistic function. They don't even think of themselves as journalists, and yet they are more journalists than the ones who are working for the traditional media. Si, aggiungo che c'è anche un effetto di ritorno perché queste piattaforme, queste best practice, aiutano poi i media a fare bene il loro lavoro. Noi, per esempio, usiamo Ushahidi e CrowdMap per mappare a livello locale di città eh, le strade che non funzionano, i parchi che vanno sistemati. Quindi ci ha dato uno strumento utile per fare meglio il nostro lavoro di media e di giornali. Yes. You know, the the other thing which I was thinking about is that whether it's uh, tools like Yushidi or, or Twitter or Facebook updates for publications, large publications, let's say like New York Times or the Washington Post or whosoever, it is perhaps time for them to start thinking of themselves as technology platforms to take what is out there from crowdsourced information and create highly interactive visualizations in real time which can work on phones, iPads. Those are the resources of big publications which can, they can bring. I mean, the fact is, you know, uh, Ezra Klein uh, is, is trying to invent a new platform
for doing what newspapers have traditionally done for this new reality of multiple devices, multiple touch experiences, mm -hmm. is a good example of like how uh, the, the old media can adapt to this new world. They have to think of themselves less as editors and more as product managers, more as you know, software entrepreneurs in that sense. And I think that thinking, we are so limited by the way we define journalism. We are limited by the industrial definition of journalism. The journalism is all about, journalism like all media is about uh, attention. And attention comes to places which are, uh, you know, which inform, educate, entertain, and they're actually very visual. I mean, the reason you like the front page of a paper, it's a very visual experience. You can quickly look at it and understand what story is important and what story is not. So similarly, there are all these tools which bring up all the news from around the world, except you can't make sense of it as a human being. So companies, if they are not going to do the job, somebody else will come along yeah. and do it. I mean, that is the, the sentiment and the reality and the data is all out there. The, the publications have to start putting it together. And it's also very monetizable because if you keep my attention on what's happening in, let's say, Ukraine for, I don't know, two hours, you can put ads against that. Or if you can put, take all the data from all the Homicide Watch information and put it on, on a special page in Washington Post, that can be used to you know, put some kind of advertising, whether it's public advertising or whatever. There is an ability to make money off these things. We just are so defining ourselves as the old containers, like the containers of the past, containers of the industrial era, that we just don't even let the imagination soak in. I think instead of waiting for the future to come and destroy the publications, it's time for publications to just you know, okay, we're gonna experiment with multiple things, What see what works. And I think, to some extent, I would say well, uh, New York Times is very, is being more experimental than most other publications I've ever seen. So that's the other side, like, you know, where you go from the crowdsourced and crowd-informed journalism to what can actually be a real proper professional journalist product. I think the difference um, between, is my mic on? Yeah. Thank you. I think the difference between what a platform like Ushahidi or C Click Fix or Homicide Watch does from what the New York Times does is that it makes very specific asks of the community and audience and it creates pathways for action. It says, send us your report for a pothole. Tell us um, what your, you know, this is the place for a memorial. Um, and it makes those expectations clear and upfront and it gives you something to do. Media traditionally has not done that. It has said, pay the bill for your subscription. If you read the paper or not, we don't really care. Um, the leap out of that was click to the next story or measuring time on site, we want you to read through. But media has not made asks of the audience in the way that these platforms do. And I think that asking is, is a better measurement of engagement than anything else. That's a great. That's a great point. It's not, and but it's not just asking. And uh, Andy Carbon made this point, which you just alluded to about it, if you are truly engaged with the community mm -hmm. of your readers, then when you ask for something, they will willingly do it or support it because they know that you are all in this together. Your your goals are the same. When the New York Times asks for something, they just want you to give them something so that then they can put it in a newspaper or in an article. There's no sort of obvious give and take. There's no kind of obvious value exchange. It's just, we're the New York Times. Please give us all your information so that we can publish it because that's what we do. That's a totally different, you know, relationship than what you're describing, I think. Part of what we do on Homicide Watch is modeling good behavior. And it's not just us engaging with the community and saying, we're engaging with you this way. We hope that you engage with us this way too but among the community, highlighting those who are engaging in the right. way that we want to see others engage. With each other. So doing things like comments of the day in order to show the types of comments we want to see coming in, um, and then making that ask within the comment of contribute to this discussion, right. be a part of it, um, and, and contribute in this way. I think uh, this is just one other thing, um, you know, now that we're talking about the user and, and making it easy and making some clear ask of them, Sometimes I think we overestimate 
especially with social media, with maybe the example of Kenya might, uh, might, might you know, tell us some kind of microcosm. We have 22 million people, almost 50% of our population with access to the internet, 13.1 um, million internet subscribers. Now, 4 million people on Facebook, and uh, approximately, it's a guesstimate, it's in the report, half a million people on Twitter, because Twitter won't tell me, but I know there's Twitter people here, yeah. all right? Hope you're listening. Um, <laughs> now, with that, you just, you keep going down. So sometimes we, the, the, the functional literacy of using the internet uh, is overstated, is, is not overstated, but we, we make the assumption that, and I, and, I, and I like what you said just now, new, uh, media should try and find ways to disrupt themselves now, especially in emerging markets or with ideas that face out, as opposed to watching as time destroys the actual business model that they, they've, they've risen on, right? Because the last 10 years will look nothing like the next 10 years, right? And I think um, in, the, in the report, uh, sin, you know, since we published it, WhatsApp is the reason I think it's, it's such an important um, tool is that, yes, it looks like perhaps a very straightforward instant messenger, but how rapidly it's being adapted, used, and growing month on month. Um, I think, you know, last time they said was, you know, um, a few weeks ago, it's, you know, 500 million monthly active users and, and growing, you know, and obviously the Facebook acquisition, um, that, that was nice, uh, but, but, but um, or interesting at, at the very least, you know, it's nice mm -hmm. for the co-founders. Um, but in places like Kenya, and right now, the, what the BBC, for example, is doing with it in India, you know, monitoring the Indian election, WhatsApp's, the functional literacy of WhatsApp is closer to SMS, meaning that you need to just learn how to send an SMS, and WhatsApp makes it easier for you to, you know, hold this button to send an audio note, take a picture and send it. Whereas with Twitter, sign in. Um, what's your login and password? All right, do you know what a retweet, a mention, and a hashtag is? Okay, great, because you need to tweet us, which means you need to upload it. Mm -hmm. Whereas Facebook, Facebook, you need to get on our page, or you need to tag us. Email, you need that email address. You need to, like, uh, email is very straightforward, but email is is again, just not particularly the best. Whereas WhatsApp has that, and you know, like right now we've got a tool which we're, we're, we're piloting and we've got a couple people using it. But I think that as the single most interesting thing for emerging markets, when you go back to this question of behavior and that call to action and making it easy, whereas this mm -hmm. app is already installed on somebody's phone, you're not asking people to download this app and then learn how to be citizen journalists. You're not asking them to download WordPress and so on, but you're putting it in front of them on something they use. For me, at least, there's another lesson for WhatsApp, and that is when you look at how Facebook, which is a huge entity, I mean, vast, a billion mm -hmm. users, you know, $150 billion market cap, you can tell Mark Zuckerberg saw WhatsApp, more, SM, more message volume than the entire SMS network globally, 30 people, and, and he thought, oh my God, or words to that effect, you know, we are screwed. Like, this is... This, thing, this is the thing that could disrupt us. So he paid whatever price was necessary to get it. Look at how traditional media view similar things. They see something like that and they think, well, that's ridiculous. Why would anybody be interested in that? We're the New York Times. We're the Washington Post. And so their response is completely different. It isn't, wow, this might disrupt our business. We better pay attention and figure out how it works. It's, it's you know, we're the media we determine what is successful or how we respond to our audience. Two completely different yeah. ways of looking at it. Okay. <coughs> Adesso lasceremo uh, la parola al, al pubblico per un po' di domande, però visto che siete qui tutti e due, veramente avrei la curiosità di sapere perché avete chiuso per content e mh, qual è la strategia di, di Gigao. So this is, a paid content was our third acquisition. We acquired JK on the Run, the Apple blog, and then we acquired paid content. After a little while, of that JK on the Run, Apple blog, and paid content were subsumed into the main brand. That's how we do things whenever we acquire. It is, we give the audience of that site enough time to transition to the main brand, and, and then we switch over. So that's so, so voi pensate che ci voglia un, un brand eh, forte e non ci si debba dividere in varie... Eh, um, una domanda di un altro tipo a Matthew. Se tu fossi stato il direttore del Washington Post, avresti lasciato andare via Ezra Klein oppure no? Che è la stessa domanda fatta in un altro modo.
I think, um, you know, obviously if I were the owner and or publisher and or editor of the Washington Post, I would have a whole bunch of different considerations that I would have to take into account that I don't now, so I'm free to say whatever I want. And I think they made a mistake, um, and I've told Marty Barron, who's the editor of that, and obviously he disagrees. <laughs> and if I knew Jeff Bezos, I would tell him that. I've certainly told him uh, in columns that I've written. I think they, <clears throat> you know, going back to what I said, I think that traditional media needs to think about new ways of reaching new readers, not new ways of reaching existing readers. They need to think about broadening their reach and, and doing things in a different way, not just taking the same content and putting it on mobile or the same content and putting it somewhere else. So I think what Ezra was trying to describe and what he's trying to build is a different way of doing the same function, that explanatory function. So the, the use of cards or the use of different you know, visual models, the way they, they approach a topic, the way they want to engage with their audience, those are all things that the Washington Post could learn from. But the Post's response was, well, you want to build something separate. Well, we don't want that. We want you to be part of the Post, and we want you to do things for the Post. We don't want you to build some kind of separate entity with a separate name that you would run. Well, why not? Because I think that's how you learn. Those are the things that, that can help extend the journalism that you do and, and broaden it and, and allow you to figure out new things about how you're going to do it. So yes, was he asking for a lot of money? From the sounds of it, yes. Did he want to build something fairly substantial? Yes. Um, the Post's response was, well, we already gave you a bunch of money and you built your wonk blog and so on and we're trying to help you. Um, and so you're asking for too much. That's, you know, they had business reasons for making that decision. I'm sure Jeff Bezos did as well. I think they made the wrong decision. Okay. <coughs> Se ci sono domande dal pubblico, abbiamo una ventina di minuti. Quarto d'ora. Ciao, sono Luca. Uh, una domanda per Om Malik. Uh, la seguo da, da quando ha aperto Giga Om e quindi ho anche letto che recentemente ha deciso di smettere di scrivere per avere un ruolo più eh, manageriale anche nel, nel venture capitalism. Eh, pensa che sia non il, il, il futuro del giornalismo e il venture capitalism, ma il futuro dei giornalisti di diventare imprenditori di se stessi e quindi di fare un salto eh, e pensare anche al business delle testate, non semplicemente a scrivere o a curare i contenuti? Grazie. First of all, thank you for reading and following me for all these years. Uh, the, the reason I decide to take a step back is that a lot of people don't realize it, that I've been an internet journalist for about 22 years and I've, write, I've written every day and I've basically slept between three to four hours every night. <laughs> and at some point you hit exhaustion and you just say, enough, I can't do this anymore. Not, I said, I will not be a practicing for professional journalist. That doesn't preclude me writing for my own satisfaction. That's, those are two separate things. I became a venture capitalist because I'm about to, I will be 50 soon, and I think that's the natural progression for my career, not for other people. For my personal career, I spent a lot of time uh, on my journalist uh, career for almost 27 years or so. And it's been, it's been the internet journalism, the hard fact is that it's a grind, especially if you're in the news business. And at some point you have to step back, you know, you can't play on forever. Um, as far as journalists are concerned, what they should think about, they should really be aware of the business reality of, of media. I think if they're not, they're doing themselves a disservice. I think it is good Even the, the smart uh, uh, business journalists don't know much about the business itself, and I think they need to know that. And the reason for that is that actually keeps you focused on, on like, you know, not getting too distracted by just things which are out there and understand that what we are doing, whether as, as, as journalists or on the business side, 
is to make sure that journalism does exist, that there is a way to push it forward, whether there is a way to make, you know, find ways to pay for it. And I think that's a good knowledge to have. I, I definitely think, uh, you know, I think whether you want to be a manager or not, I don't know. For me personally, I had a very great run, 28 years of like really satisfying and, you know, happy uh, journalistic career. And as at some point you said, that's it. I'm done. I, I just wanted to say, I think in terms of paying attention to the business side, as Om was mentioning, if you look at what Ezra and Nate and Jessica Lesson from the Wall Street Journal who started the information or any number of other journalists have done, they realized their own value. <clears throat> they appreciated what their value could be in a different context, not just I have a job and I get a salary from this paper, but what is my value in the sort of greater landscape of, of journalism as a business. And that's a, that's a valuable thing. Um, you know, we don't want to get too arrogant about our personal brand, but I think realizing your own value is, is a positive thing. Altre, altre domande? Una domanda per Matthew Ingram, che prima ha detto uh, che uh, non devo, non, i giornali non devono cercare modi nuovi di raggiungere lettori che hanno già, ma modi nuovi per raggiungere nuovi lettori. Io vedo due aspetti problematici in questa seconda uh, affermazione. Il primo è trovare nuovi modi e, e il secondo è trovare le cose da dire ai nuovi lettori. Mentre il primo aspetto mi sembra sostanzialmente un aspetto di cultura digitale della testata, per cui anche se è un problema in molti casi, in, in questo momento non è quello su cui mi voglio soffermare. Quello che vedo più problematico è produrre i contenuti per i nuovi lettori, soprattutto alla luce dell'altra affermazione che lei faceva prima, cioè l'impossibilità per una testata o un brand di essere generalisti, ovvero di andare dall'oroscopo all'omicidio. Quindi come venirne fuori? Grazie. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. <clears throat> um, it is, I'm, I think what Laura and, and Ohm have both talked about is knowing who your reader is. Not, and that's different than knowing who your readers are, if you know what I mean. Knowing specifically who your readers are, knowing kind of personal or private information about them when they read things knowing in, in kind of a general sense who you are trying to appeal to. So who is that reader? What do they want? What are they interested in knowing about? When I say reach new readers, I mean reach new versions of those people. So you have an existing group who are interested in whatever it is you do. How do you reach new people who are interested in that thing? How do you, how do you not so much do you, how do you expand into new areas? In fact, one of my concerns about 538 and Nate Silver's site is that he might be diluting the thing that made him so great. So his, his original brand was, I'm the guy who understands numbers, who, who uses those numbers to put things into context like elections or sporting events. Now he's trying to say, I'm a guy who understands numbers about everything. And so I'm going to tell you about, you know, things that have no relationship to either politics or sports, new areas. So that's, that's asking readers to make a leap into new areas that he hasn't covered before. I'm not saying that he's not going to succeed, but that's a different sort of game than what he was doing before. And I think he probably could have stuck to those two areas and expanded dramatically and reached many, many new readers who were interested in those things without kind of trying to do everything, trying to be the numbers guy about everything. Um, so I think you just have to ask, you know, obviously he decided that that was necessary in order to make his business model work. Um, and so I guess we'll find out whether that's true or not. But everyone who's doing that has to decide, what is your goal? What are you trying to achieve? And, and what's the best way to do that? Un'ultimissima domanda. No, va bene. Eh, io volevo solo dire un'ultima cosa no. e poi chiudiamo. Questo panel è un esempio 
perfetto di quella che viene chiamata diversità. Credo che questo nei media tradizionali occidentali sia un problema di cui dobbiamo tenere tutti conto, perché questo, non è, non è, questo panel non esiste nei giornali tradizionali. E forse questo è un tema di cui sarebbe importante parlare, però ce ne vorrebbe, ci vorrebbe un panel a parte. Grazie a tutti per essere stati con noi, grazie ai nostri ospiti e buon festival.